So let's let everybody take their seats. Uh, thank you. So welcome to the fourth Wetton lecture. Uh, we are halfway through the workshop that is associated uh, with this lecture. Uh, and so we've had a terrific first day uh, and we're very much looking forward to an exciting second day. Uh, and it's my great pleasure to introduce the wet and lecturer associated with this event, Rachel Somerville from the Center for Computational Astrophysics at the Flatiron Institute in New York City. So Rachel did her PhD at UCSC, uh, University of California, Santa Cruz, a place where I did my first postdoc. Uh, but she did her PhD much later. Uh, and, and she's held positions at the University of Michigan, the Space Telescope Science Institute, the Max Planck Institute for Astronomy in Heidelberg, uh, and the Johns Hopkins University, before she became the Downsborough Chair in Astrophysics and Distinguished Professor at the Department of Physics and Astronomy at Rutgers University. In 2020, however, she moved to the Flatiron Institute to lead their computer astrophysics section. Rachel is recognized for creating computer simulations in the physics of underlying galaxy formation and evolution. And in 2013, she was awarded the American Astronomical Society Danny Heinemann Prize for astrophysics for providing fundamental insights into galaxy evolution and formation. 2014, she was awarded a Simons Investigator Award, which I suspect might have something to do with why she's now at the Flatiron Institute. So please welcome uh, Rachel Somerville, who's going to give the fourth Wetton Lecture, Peering Back to Cosmic Dawn to Decode the Mysteries of Galaxy Evolution. Rachel. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to Professor Davies and the organizing committee for inviting me to be here. I'm absolutely delighted and honored to be able to speak to you tonight. And happy autumn equinox, everyone. It seems a very appropriate night to talk about things astronomical. Before I begin, I'd also like to acknowledge that this work that I'll be telling you about was done in collaboration with a very large group of people. Much of this work is done these days in large teams. And so I'd like to very gratefully acknowledge the contributions of all of my collaborators, and many of them will be mentioned by name as we go along. So as Professor Davies mentioned, this lecture um, is part of a workshop entitled Galaxies Near and Far, Bridging Observations and Simulations. And when I heard the title of this workshop, I really thought, I mean, this, this sort of sums up my life ambitions. So, so often, you know, astrophysics may seem like a very specialized endeavor for, to those of you from outside, but in fact, we tend to get in our little um, niches and the people working on nearby galaxies don't talk to the people working on distant galaxies and the people working on theoretical simulations don't talk to the observers as much as we should. So this program of building bridges is very much up my alley and I will try to um, address that in this lecture tonight. So in the immortal words of the brilliant Douglas Adams, Space is really, really big. You just won't believe how vastly, hugely, mind-bogglingly big it is. Quoting Douglas Adams. So again, for those of you who don't think about astronomy every day, um, we, we don't use miles or kilometers because it just gets too cumbersome. We like to use parsecs or light years. So of course, a light year is the distance that light travels in one year, and it's uh, about one parsec is about three or four light years. Okay, so you can kind of, you know, order of magnitude equate them. So I'll be saying parsecs a lot, or millions of parsecs, or billions of parsecs. Okay, so you can try to translate that. Um, so galactic scales are roughly tens of thousands of parsecs, and cosmological scales are billions of parsecs. So in order to understand galaxies, one of the most challenging things about this is that we need to understand physics 
happening from the scales of stars, which is millionths of parsecs, up to cosmological scales. The time units that we bandy about are also quite large. So this is sort of a whirlwind history of cosmic time. So what we think of as the beginning of time, uh, the Big Bang, was about 13.8 billion years ago. And we think that the very first stars and galaxies started to form around 200 million years after the Big Bang. Now, we don't actually know when the first stars formed. That is something that we may uh, be able to learn about shortly. And then our sun formed about 9 billion years after the Big Bang. So we're very fortunate as astronomers to have an array of telescopes, both on the ground and in space. A couple of famous ones are pictured here, but there are, of course, many, many more. And something that is very important and very powerful is that we are able to observe light, electromagnetic radiation, across the spectrum, across many different wavelengths, from gamma rays, the shortest wavelengths, all the way out to radio, the longest wavelengths that we tend to consider in astronomy. And this is important because these different wavelengths of light tell us about different components of the universe and different physical processes in the universe. So for example, our sun produces light mainly in the visible part of the spectrum, not surprisingly, right? That's where our eyes were designed to be able to see well. But a, a hotter, more massive star produces most of its light in the ultraviolet. If we want to be able to see emission from dust, we would need to look in the infrared. If we want to see very energetic emission, for example, from very, very hot gas, we might need to look in the X-ray, and so on and so forth. So we use this suite of telescopes in concert to be able to study um, this wide range of physical processes. Now, this is complicated because some of these wavelengths of light are absorbed by our atmosphere, and that's why we sometimes have to put telescopes in space. So a reporter asked me recently, I've been talking to reporters a lot lately, um, why do you find galaxies so interesting? And that, that was sort of an interesting question, right? Because this is my life's work. It's like, well, obviously they're interesting, right? But after thinking about it, I, I thought, if you look at galaxies, so here are some images of, of galaxies, no two galaxies are quite alike. So a bit like people, right? Every galaxy is unique. And yet, if you start to look at large numbers of galaxies, you start to notice patterns. You start to notice trends and correlations. So um, you'll, you can see here that although each of these galaxies is a little bit different, that they might fall into two broad categories, right? Some of them have these thin disks, which we know to be rotating. Some of them are more sort of roundish, what we call spheroidal, like a ball. Um, and the disk-like ones, tend to be very blue and have a lot of young stars. The spheroidal ones tend to be very red and have much older stars. So that's just an example of the kinds of patterns and correlations that we've known about for decades and decades, but that we can now quantify in great detail because we have large surveys of galaxies, like the one shown here. It's a bit hard to point here. This is called the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, which allows us to study the properties of populations of galaxies for many millions of objects. We also have telescopes, like the Hubble Space Telescope, that are able to look very, very deep into the distant universe. So this is called the Hubble Ultra Deep Field, and this was, is the deepest, most sensitive optical image of the sky. And because it takes light a finite amount of time to travel to us, when we look at very distant objects, we're using the universe as a time machine. 
We're looking at galaxies as they were in the past. So in this Hubble Deep Field, we're now going to get in our spaceship and start to fly back in time or outwards in distance. And what you'll see is that as we look further and further back in time, the galaxy population starts to look different. So if we could count these galaxies, we would notice that we don't see very many large, massive galaxies anymore. The galaxies tend to be much smaller in the past. And we also notice that their structure is different, right? So instead of these beautiful spirals like we saw before, they tend to look much more blobby. Now, some of what you saw in this visualization is just the artifacts of the way that we observe and the limitations of the telescope, but I still think um, it's kind of a nice tool to give you a sense for the kinds of observations that we have um, of the deep and distant universe. So we can also quantify these kinds of correlations um, between galaxies' properties and put them on graphs, which is like astro what, what astronomers like to do. And we see surprisingly tight correlations between many of the properties of galaxies. So a couple of examples are shown here. One example is that the mass of stars in a galaxy is very tightly correlated with the amount of heavy elements, so what we call metals, um, elements heavier than helium. Similarly, the mass of the bulge part of a galaxy is tightly correlated with the mass of its black hole. So many of these correlations are not obvious why they should exist on the face of it. So they must be telling us something fundamental about the physics that shapes these properties for galaxies. Okay, so this is just a little summary of what I've just shown you, that we can measure many statistical properties of galaxies back in cosmic time um, to about 95% of the, of the age of the universe. And we see that galaxies show these patterns or scaling relations. And we also can quantify how the demographics of galaxies have changed over cosmic time. So we're, we can do a very good job of measuring and quantifying galaxy properties. But we would like to know why, right? Why are galaxies this way? Why do we see them changing in this way? So in order to answer the question of why, uh, we really need some kind of theory or model. And the standard model that we use in modern cosmology is prosaically called lambda cold dark matter. Um, my PhD supervisor, Joel Premack, has coined the term double dark, which I like much better because it makes me think of chocolate. So we can call it double dark. Um, so the double dark theory says that only about 5% of the total matter and energy in the universe is in what you probably think of as normal matter, so atoms, protons, neutrons, things like that. And 25% is cold dark matter, which we don't know what it is, but we know that it interacts via gravity the same way that normal matter does and doesn't interact via any other force. So it does not emit radiation, anything like that. And then the other 70% is dark energy, which we really don't know what it is, <laughs> but we know that it exists because we observe that the expansion rate of the universe, so you all know that the universe is expanding, right? But the rate of that expansion has been getting faster and faster, has been accelerating, which is the opposite of what you would expect in the absence of this dark energy. So the dark energy is sort of pushing space-time apart and causing um, the expansion rate to accelerate. And then of that 5% that's normal matter, only about 7% is in the form of the stars that we could see in the images that I was showing you. So we're seeing the tip of the tip of the iceberg 
um, of the universe with our telescopes. So one reason that we like dark matter so much is that it's relatively easy to figure out what it does because it only interacts via gravity. So we can actually put it in a computer and we can solve the equations for how matter attra is attracted to other matter via gravity. And we can do these large computer simulations of how dark matter should evolve in the universe. So this has been, been done um, quite extensively over the past decades. And you can see on the top here what, what it looks like if you put the universe in a box. And you started from very early times when the universe was very smooth, but there were some small lumps. And then over time, as the universe expands, wherever you have a little bit more matter, gravity is stronger, and so it attracts and forms larger and larger lumps. And you end up forming these very large structures. So this is about a billion light years, two, two billion light years, this scale here. So this is what our theoretical prediction is for how dark matter should be distributed on these very large scales. And you remember I showed you the picture from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey before of how real galaxies are distributed in the, in the universe. That's shown on the left here. And you can just see by eye that they look rather similar, right? So this very simple picture where the universe has only dark matter that is attracted by gravity already is giving us the kinds of large-scale structures that we see. So that seems very promising. And maybe you can see, if you look closely, at the intersections of these sort of filamentary structures that have formed, you get lumps of dark matter that are bound by gravity. So they're not expanding anymore. They're bound together by gravity, and they can actually collapse. And we call those dark matter halos. I'm not sure why we call them dark matter halos. I guess maybe people had some image of like the medieval saints with their halos or something like that. So dark matter halo is a fancy name for a big lump of dark matter that's bound together. And this is where we think galaxies form. So we think that basically all galaxies live within this dark matter halo, which is much bigger than the galaxy itself. Okay, so now we can compare the number of dark matter halos that we see in our simulations to the number of galaxies that we count with our telescopes. And in order to make those match, we need to assume something a little strange. We need to assume that galaxies are very bad at making stars. So galaxies are only able to convert a small fraction of the gas that should be available to them into stars. At the peak, maybe around 20% and as low as 1%. Now remember, I'd already told you that only 7% of all the matter in the universe is in stars. So for some reason, galaxies are bad at making stars. You'd think that would be their one job, right? But somehow, they are not very good at it. So we'd like to understand why that is. And in order to do that, we have to think about some messier physics than just gravity. So we have to think about what starts to happen. So as the dark matter is drawn into the, these dark matter halos, of course, gas is drawn in along with it. Gas also feels the gravity. And when the gas starts to get dense, the gas can radiate energy and cool, cool down, become colder. And when gas becomes colder, it tends to collapse more. And when it collapses more, it gets denser and it cools faster, right? So you get a runaway process of collapse. And when the gas gets dense enough and cold enough, it can form stars. Okay, glossing over a lot of details there. People spend their whole lives studying this process, of course. Once stars start to form, stars obviously make light, produce radiation, and when star, massive stars eventually explode as supernovae, which also deposit lots of energy um, into the gas surrounding them. Now we think 
that within most galaxies, there may also be a supermassive black hole, which can also accrete gas and produce light and produce energy. This is a fascinating topic that is actually one of the main things that I work on, but I will not talk about it today in the interest of time. But I do want to talk a bit more about um, what happens when stars and supernovae start to form in a galaxy. So we call this process stellar feedback. And stellar feedback is sort of a catch-all term that refers to several different things. So for example, inside a cloud of gas where stars are forming, so you can see an image here from such a star-forming cloud in our own galaxy, you can kind of see how the stars are really kind of eating away the gas and preventing new stars from being able to form in those, in those locations. So you can see that there would be kind of a feedback loop, a feedback cycle set up by this process. At the same time, as I mentioned, massive stars can explode as supernovae. Now these supernovae, again, are very small on galactic scales, only a few parsecs. And yet, we see huge winds driven by stars and supernovae coming out of galaxies. So this is a very funny looking object. This is called Messier 82. Here's what it would look like if you just looked at it in the optical. But what's shown here is light that is tracing hot gas that's flowing out of the galaxy at rather high speeds. And again, this scale is thousands of parsecs. So somehow these little bitty supernovae are driving these gigantic outflows of gas from galaxies. But remember, that galaxy is embedded inside this much bigger dark matter halo, right? And there's gravity from the dark matter. So probably that gas does not completely escape the clutches of the galaxy, and it will probably fall back. So we can think of a feedback cycle on a larger scale as well. This is often called the cosmic baryon cycle. And you can think of this maybe a little bit like our terrestrial cycle, right, where you have water condensing in the atmosphere, falling down as rain, and then evaporating or you know, going back up. So we can, might have a similar, very large scale cycle going on within galactic halos. So we can try to put all of these physical processes in numerical simulations, like the one I showed you before. But now in addition to gravity, we also have to include the physics of how gas responds to changes in pressure, what we call hydrodynamics how gas gets heated up and cools down, what we call thermodynamics, and also all of these so-called small-scale processes, so basically these processes of star formation, stellar feedback, black hole formation, black hole feedback. And the problem is, if we want to do a simulation that captures many, many galaxies, right? We need to study galaxies as a population, right? Because every galaxy is different. So you, you need to study a bunch of them to really understand them. If you want to simulate a large volume with lots of galaxies in it, you cannot resolve the individual stars and supernovae. So you have to put something in to your simulation to tell it what to do on the scales smaller than what you can resolve in the computer, okay? So this is what are called subgrid recipes. And so many, many groups have done this in different ways. You can see examples on the bottom here of many of these large volume cosmological simulations that have been developed over the years. But the problem is, because we can't really simulate those processes we don't really understand how they work. We have knobs in our simulations that we can turn to change how strong the feedback is. So for example, let's suppose 
you make the feedback stronger, you'll form less stars, you'll form less mass, you'll form fewer galaxies, and you'll also puff the galaxy up. So you can see here, a strong feedback case, how puffy this galaxy has gotten. So when you change that feedback knob, you're not just changing one property of the galaxy, you're, you're, you're changing everything about it, okay? Similarly, if the feedback is weaker, you'll form fewer stars, the galaxy will look much more compact. So you could imagine, remember we had those observational relationships for how big galaxies should be, how massive they should be, how many heavy elements they should have. We can turn our knobs until we fit the simulations to the observations. And that's what we have had to do up until now. Okay, so you might call this a phenomenological approach to simulating these processes. And this has been remarkably successful. There have been non-trivial successes from using this approach. This is just one example. This is called the illustrious TNG simulation. Um, all the simulations have to have cute names now um, to, to make things more fun. But so what you can see is that we again see these large scale structures, these large filaments, like we saw before, we see those in the universe, that's good. But we also form galaxies that look a lot like real galaxies, right? You form spheroidal galaxies, you form disk galaxies, they have more or less the right correlations with other things. They have the right correlations with their environment. So there were successes from these models that were not put in by hand, even though we did have to put some of the physics in by hand. Okay, but remember we see these winds, we see this gas flowing out of galaxies, and we can try to measure how much gas is flowing out of real galaxies that we can see. So, we can quantify this by something called the mass loading, or the, so take the amount of gas flowing out of the galaxy per unit time, and divide it by the rate that new stars are being born. Okay, of course the stars are the things driving these outflows, so this sort of says for a given number of new stars, how much gas do I push out? Okay, so these points are observational estimates of how much gas is getting pushed out. And the lines are predictions from the kinds of simulations I was just showing you. Now there are a lot of uncertainties here I want to emphasize, you know, in terms of the building bridges theme, we are not getting these numbers in the same way from observations and simulations at the moment. We should do a better job with that. But it looks rather like the observed outflow rates are a lot smaller, right, than what we had to put into our simulations. So just remember this number, this is unfortunately a log plot, which I realize is not intuitive, but so log of zero is one, around one is probably about what we observe for this ratio of mass coming out to new stars being born. Okay, so people have been trying to drill down and do simulations that can do a better job of actually capturing this process of stellar feedback and supernova feedback. So these are simulations called the fire simulations. And instead of trying to simulate a whole huge volume, now we're just simulating one galaxy at a time. So they could only do around 10 galaxies, or maybe they have 12 now, I'm not sure. And the smallest element now, instead of being I don't know, a million times the mass of our sun, it's more like a hundred or a thousand times the mass of our sun. So they can get closer to simulating the stellar feedback from first principles, but there's still, they still needed to put some things in a little bit by hand. So now what we can do is go into those simulations and try to measure very carefully how much gas is flowing out of the galaxy. So on the Left side here, um, you can see a sort of zoomed out view of the galaxy where you can think of this yellow circle as sort of being the full extent of the dark matter halo. And this is a zoomed in version of the same galaxy. So here you're seeing closer to the galaxy itself. And the only thing being shown here is the gas. 
that's coming out of the galaxy. And where it's red, the gas is very hot. And where it's blue, the gas is very cold. So what you can see is that during the course of this galaxy's formation over cosmic time, it's a bit like the cartoon that I showed you, right? Where gas is coming in and flowing out at the same time. And we can go in and measure the rate that the gas is flowing out in these simulations. So those simulations started to come out maybe five years ago or so. Very recently, and I'm talking really about the last couple of months, this, this is a paper that's in preparation to be submitted soon. We've been able to go down even further to do simulations of an entire galaxy where the particle is almost the same as the mass of a single star, okay? These particles in this simulation are four times the mass of our sun. And this galaxy was chosen to be representative of one of our closest neighbors, the Large Magellanic Cloud. So here's our galaxies near. And uh, so this is a remarkable achievement that we are finally able to really resolve individual exploding supernovae blast waves in the context of an entire galaxy, albeit a small galaxy. But OK, small galaxies are, are interesting, right? And then we can similarly measure the amount of mass actually coming out, where we can really put in the supernovae in a physical way. And guess what? When we do the simulations where we had to dial in the winds to fit galaxy properties, we got very large amounts of mass coming out. That mass loading factor was like 10 or even 100. When we did the, the more physical simulations, the single galaxy simulations, so, the, so here's the, um, the older simulations, here's the single galaxy simulations, the mass coming out came down a lot. And now here are our new simulations, here's this large Magellanic Cloud simulation, that's even lower. So in a way that's good, right, because this seems to agree better with what we observed, but what that means is that if we went and put that number back into our big simulation, it wouldn't re reproduce all of those properties of galaxies that we were so happy to get right. Okay, so this is, this is a puzzle right now. Um, one possible resolution to this puzzle is that maybe galaxies aren't bad at making stars because they kick everything out. There's two ways to play that game, right? Maybe once the gas is kicked out, it doesn't come back in as fast as we thought. So this is sometimes called preventative feedback. And maybe one reason we're getting that wrong in the large volume simulations is that it turns out that if you really think about the physics of what happens to a cold, dense cloud of gas as it moves through hot, low-density gas, there's some complicated physics that goes on there, right? So if there are physicists here, you have Kelvin Helmholtz and Raleigh Taylor instabilities, you would have to be resolving, again, processes on scales down to parsecs in order to properly understand how that gas interacts with all the other stuff that it has to push out into to get out of the galaxy. And we're not simulating that properly right now in our large volume simulations. We know that. So I'm um, quite delighted to share this collaboration in the home of Tolkien um, this is called the SMAUG Collaboration, which stands for Simulating Multiscale Astrophysics to Understand Galaxies. And it's a contrived acronym, but we have a really cool logo, <laughs> I think. Not that I'm unbiased here. So the goal of this collaboration is to say, okay, no more turning of knobs. Let's do these small scale simulations. Let's do simulations on the scale where the physics is happening and try to understand 
how that works, and then put that into these large volume simulations, then you've got nothing left to tune, right? Or if you, maybe if you tune, you tune again to the smaller scale simulations. So you have this sort of ladder of multi-scale simulations to build you up to the larger scales again. So we have a new model for how these stellar driven winds work in galaxies. This is called Project Arkenstone. I'm sure you all recall that the Arkenstone was Smaug's favorite treasure. So this is at the core of understanding galaxies. And this slide is a bit technical, but basically our model describes how mass is kicked out, how the winds are launched, and how the mass interacts with the material around it, with the gas that it's pushing through by implementing these subgrid recipes based on small scale simulations like the ones that I've shown you. And I'm going to skip a bunch of the technical details. We've now implemented this new model in an isolated Milky Way mass galaxy. It seems to be working. And the next step is to implement it in a large volume cosmological simulation and see if it works. It may not work, right? It's a little terrifying, but hey. Okay, so I think I'm actually doing well here. Um, so let me try to summarize what I've just been telling you, and then we, then we go to the far universe. So numerical simulations of galaxy formation have had many successes, but they've had these tuned phenomenological recipes that have limited their predictive power. But we've made a huge amount of progress in actually drilling down and understanding those processes better. So we need to incorporate that understanding and those insights into the large volume cosmological simulations, and then we'll learn a huge amount. Okay, so who wants to hear about the James Webb Space Telescope? All right, so a quick tour of the James Webb Space Telescope for those of you who may not live and breathe it as I've been doing for the last few months. Um, so it is a six meter diameter mirror, which is a bigger mirror than previous telescopes, like say the Spitzer Space Telescope, which we called a trash can sized galaxy. It was about that big. Uh, sorry, trash can sized telescope, about that big. So it's big and it observes in the infrared, right? So um, remember infrared is longer wavelength than visible. And why is that important? Well, so remember the universe is expanding and the further away something is, the faster it's moving away from us. And of course, when something's moving towards us or away from us, the light gets Doppler shifted right, red shifted if it's moving away from us. So if you want to look at something very, very far away, if, it w if the light was emitted in the optical, it gets red shifted into the infrared, right? So if you wanna see very distant things, you need to look in the infrared. And this was one of the main reasons that the James Webb Space Telescope was designed, was to look for the most distant, very earliest galaxies it turns out that the infrared is also interesting for many other reasons. You can see features in the atmospheres of planets around other stars. You can see glowing dust um, from galaxies and stars. So the James Webb Space Telescope is amazing and we're learning um, many, many, many things from it. It has four main instruments on board. So it has cameras that are very much like the camera on your cell phone. It also has spectrographs that disperse the light in wavelength um, so that you can see features like emission lines or absorption lines. And it also has a coronagraph, um, which is like when you want to look at a bright light and you put your hand in front of the bright light to see it better. So it can block out the light from a star in order to see the faint planets orbiting around it. And this, this is just an ooh-ah picture showing you the scale of this monster. This is a huge, huge machine. You can see the scale compared to um, human beings here. Uh, so this 
mirror is made of these segments, these hexagonal segments, and the mirror is made of beryllium coated in a very, very thin layer of gold, which turns out to be a very nice surface for infrared light. This is showing you the sunshade. So because this telescope observes in the infrared, you have to keep it very, very cool. You can't have it being heated up by the sun. Um, so it has these huge sunshades the size of a tennis court. And these sunshades had to be able to roll up and then unroll themselves in space. How terrifying is that? So here they are testing this process. The first time they tried it, the sunshades ripped and everyone was very upset. But thankfully, when the telescope got out into space, the sunshades unrolled beautifully. So the James Webb, after many delays, probably, you know, many of you in the room remember. Um, I remember first hearing about it when I was a graduate student, which was a long time ago, more than 20 years ago now. Um, so it's been a long time in coming, but we got an amazing Christmas present this past year. Uh, James Webb was launched on Christmas Day. The launch was absolutely flawless. Everything went really perfectly, and here's the view, the last view of Webb um, as it is leaving Earth. So this telescope is too big to fit inside any rocket that we have, so it had to be made to fold up and go inside the rocket and then after the rocket fell away, it had to be able to unfold in space. So there's a wonderful video. I encourage you to go online and Google James Webb deployment, um, and you can see each stage of you know, the mirror unfolding, the secondary coming out, the sunshade unrolling. I mean, it's really, it just amazes me. I, I would watch that video before the actual launch and just be like, oh God, oh God, there's so many, uh, there's so many ways this could go wrong. But it didn't. It all worked perfectly. Um, and James Webb has been operating beautifully. The first images were released to the public and to uh, the people who had been given time on July 12th. Oops. And, oops, so people often ask, well, where is James Webb? Where is it exactly? It turns out there's an app for that. Okay, so I was watching this obsessively as the telescope was making its way out and unfolding and everything. You can still go and look um, at where is Webb. So the James Webb is actually orbiting the sun. It's in what's called the second Lagrange point. So as the Earth goes around the sun, James Webb will sort of go around like that. Okay, you don't want it to come between the Earth and the sun, right? That, that would be bad. So um, I have been involved with what's called an early release science program. So we proposed for this, I don't even know how many years ago now, seems like a very long time ago, uh, but long before the telescope launched. And the idea of these early release science programs was to sort of test out the telescope, put it through its paces, show how well it was working, and to release this early data to the public. So these data had no proprietary period. Normally when astronomers get data, they like to hold on to it for a while before they let anyone else have it and publish all their papers. So we didn't get to do that. Everyone got our data on the same day that we did. Um, so the Sears project um, is sort of like a sampler plate. We use sort of each major instrument on the telescope, um, and we use them in parallel. So it's sort of a clever strategy where you can actually do two things at once, and so they're therefore observe more efficiently. And you can read some of the science goals here. So our first observations were taken in June. We got them in July, and then a second round of observations will be taken in December. Um, so the Sears, Observations are being taken in a region of the sky called the Extended Growth Strip. Um, and the reason we chose that region of the sky is that it was already very well studied 
with the Hubble Space Telescope and many, and the Spitzer Space Telescope and the Chandra Space Telescope, many, many other telescopes. So we have many, many other wavelengths of data uh, complementing the James Webb data. Now, as I said, the James Webb was delayed many times. Uh, so we had sort of extra time to make theoretical predictions. It's a little bit convenient that way. We kept thinking, oh gosh, we've got to get these papers out. And we, we had more time, so we kept writing more and more papers based on our theoretical models. So this is a, a paper based on a model that was tuned to match observations of local galaxies, so galaxies in the very nearby universe. And we thought, okay, let's leave all our knobs alone right, that were tuned to match the local population of galaxies. And let's just see what it predicts for galaxies at very early times, at very high redshifts. So this is sort of a very fundamental quantity that is a good test for how well your models are doing. You're basically just counting galaxies of different brightnesses, different luminosities. So if you took a box and just counted galaxies, how many would there be per unit volume, okay, for bright galaxies and fainter galaxies. So all of these little points here are observations, and the lines are our models. You can see some of these lines curve down. That's just a limitation of resolution in our models. Um, but what we found, to our surprise, was that based on the observations we had before James Webb launched, so just from Hubble and ground-based telescopes, these models actually did amazingly well at reproducing the number of galaxies all the way out to redshift 9 to 10, which is around 300 million years after the Big Bang. So all the way out to very, very early times. So that's interesting. And because the models worked so well, we thought, okay, well, let's see what we can learn from this. So one of the reasons that the James Webb was built was to study this process called cosmic reionization. So in the very, very early universe, all of the hydrogen was in, in pieces. The protons and the electrons were all in a big soup. So we call that ionized, the atoms are ionized. And then at some point, sorry, re reverse. So early times, the atoms are, are neutral, the protons are connected to the electrons, and then at some point in time, those atoms become ionized, so the electrons become removed from the protons. And we think that that was done by some kind of radiation, right? So radiation can bump the electrons off from the protons. And so the question is, what was producing that radiation? What was causing the universe to go from being mostly neutral to mostly ionized, which happened around a billion years after the Big Bang. We know that from observations. So we could take our models and ask, okay, in these models, which again, were only tuned to observations of nearby galaxies, when did, when did this happen? So this diagram is showing the fraction of, of ionized hydrogen Okay, so the, again, the data points are showing observations, and our models are this, this blue line, so it agreed quite well with the observations. And we could then go in and ask, okay, what kind of galaxies were producing these photons that were ionizing the hydrogen? Were they big galaxies or small galaxies? And it turned out they were mostly small galaxies, too small to be seen by the Hubble, and many of them are even too small to be seen by James Webb. So if our models are correct, James Webb will actually not be able to see most of the galaxies that were responsible for reionization. So the other thing that we did with these models, because we were so encouraged that they matched all of the observations we had so far, was we made what we call synthetic observations. So we basically took our models and we pretended that we were observing them with the James Webb Space Telescope. Okay, so this is you know, the theme of trying to connect simulations and observations more closely. So we had to observe our models the way a light beam, you know, would travel back into the universe. We call this along the past light cone. 
So we made these light cones. Um, by the way, if there are educators or scientists in the audience, you can download all of our light cones um, from this interactive web portal, which we think is quite cool. And then we also made images of what our simulations would look like if we observed it with James Webb, with the amount of noise in those detectors, with the amount of blurring that happens because of the mirror, et cetera, et cetera. So all of the kinds of effects that happen in observations. And we actually used these images from our simulations to test the software that we needed to process the real observations because we knew that we wanted to be able to just you know, immediately process the observations the moment they hit the deck, so to speak. So we needed data that was you know, similar enough to the real data, and so we produced it using these models. And the pipeline worked, so I guess our models were pretty good. So this is showing you, so here's the sort of larger images of this extended growth strip, this field. You can see all the galaxies. Here are some fun objects um, that we saw in some of our first look at the data. And we found something that surprised us. So within, I think it was a week or two of the data coming down, over the weekend, we got an email from Steve Finkelstein, the PI of Sears, saying, I think I've found a Redshift 14 galaxy. Okay, so just to give you a sense, um, you know, this is much higher redshift, much more distant, much further in the past than any galaxy we had seen before. And we really didn't expect to see such an early, such a high redshift galaxy, especially so early on in the process. Um, so here is a little pullout showing you this galaxy. Here's sort of a blow up of what it looks like. And we call this Maisie's galaxy. Maisie is the daughter of C. Finkelstein and it was her birthday on the day that this galaxy was discovered. So this galaxy is being seen only 280 million years after the Big Bang. How, did we find, how do we find these distant galaxies? So this is now you know, going to be the bread and butter of JWST. So what you have to do is look at the galaxy at different wavelengths. So these are shorter wavelengths going to longer wavelengths. And if the galaxy is very, very distant, so stars cannot produce light at very short wavelengths, right? They sort of cut off at very short wavelengths. As that break gets redshifted, what you should see for a very distant galaxy is nothing, 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 something, 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 okay? So you should see it in the very long wavelength images and not see it in the short wavelength images. So this is Maisie's galaxy. This gives us this redshift of about 14 or so. But you have to be careful because we also found this galaxy, which if you had just had the UV and near infrared imaging, we would have thought that this was at a redshift of about 18 or so, certainly above 15. But then we looked in the millimeter wavelength. Okay, the millimeter wavelength is very good at picking up emission from dust. So this galaxy, we are not seeing at short wavelengths, not because it's very, very distant. It is fairly distant, actually. It's about at a redshift of around five, around a billion years or so after the Big Bang. But it's not, it's not redshift 18. So probably there's, you know, there's gonna be a mix of things. Um, some of them will actually be at very high redshift. The good news is that James Webb also has this spectrograph, which will be able to confirm whether these redshifts are, are really very high or not so high. So what does this all mean, right? There's been a lot of excitement. Again, as I said, I've been talking to a lot of reporters oh, what do we make of all these very distant galaxies? Did you expect to find these galaxies? Does this break all of our theories? Does this break Lambda CDM, right? This is all, there have been papers saying all of this. So it turns out, this is very hot off the press, by the way. Uh, my collaborator, Aaron Jung, sent me this over the weekend. 
If you take those same old models that we tuned to match the local galaxy population, and you just have a high enough resolution, large enough volume, dark matter simulation, and you keep pushing the models back. Okay, so these are some estimates of the number of galaxies. Again, this is a luminosity function, the number density of galaxies of different luminosities. So these are fainter galaxies, brighter galaxies. It turns out we should have expected to see these galaxies up to redshift 13 or so. There are some claims of galaxies at even higher redshifts, like redshift 16. Those, if those are real, those will break our models. <laughs> <laughs> so we will see. Um, so in summary, um, some, but not all, so not all models did this well, right? Some models were already breaking by redshift 10 or so. So we're learning a lot from these observations. We're learning about these processes of star formation and feedback. And, you know, so even if you tune to local galaxies, that doesn't prove that you're going to fit these distant galaxies. So we're learning something. Um, but if these very high redshift objects are real, then we might need to go back to the drawing board. So I think I might actually just leave this summary up. And thank you very much for your attention this evening. And take any questions. Mm -hmm.